uh, conference. Um, so this is the one on, um, on quantum, uh, quantum biology, and uh, so what, uh, what can quantum mechanics teach us about the brain? Uh, the there'll be four speakers, each one has 25 minutes. We ask you to hold the questions, because what we'd like to do is, is, is uh, just have the four talks, two of them will be virtual, two of them in person, and then have a um, half an hour session um, at the end where you can ask questions to all the speakers. Uh, the first speaker this afternoon is um, Hartmut Nelvin. He's, um, um, uh, he's uh, uh, vice president of engineering at Google and head of their manager and founder of their quantum AI lab in, in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a physicist and also computational neuroscientist. In fact, we share the same advisor, Valentin Breitenberg, in, um, in Germany, and then he got his PhD there, went to USC in LA, started a company doing computer vision. In fact, many of you use his products daily in, visuals, in Google search uh, or Street View. Um, and he's gonna tell us uh, the latest about why should the nervous system take advantage of quantum resources. Hartmut. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, um, so thank you very much to Stuart. I always enjoy this marvelous conference. So it's very stimulating. So yeah, Christoph and I, um, a few months ago, we um, uh, co-organized a workshop at Google on quantum neurobiology. And then we selected some of the best talks and, and brought them uh, here. And I actually don't practice biology today. We do engineering. We try to build a large uh, quantum computer. Um, but from an engineering perspective, I would like to give the motivation. So why should the nervous system take advantage of quantum resources? And I have a few stories for you to tell. And I actually adapted it just because um, we just heard Roger Penrose before. So let's uh, start with the first story, which is on quantum machine learning. So uh, many of you, you know, quantum or machine learning is so popular these days, I think many of you know the basics. So essentially you need two ingredients. One is a learner, let's say a large neural network, that can adapt based on training examples that are given. And the second thing you need is a large, or typically a large set of training examples, and then you present those to your learners. And there's an important um, word I wanna teach you. Machine learning people call this sample complexity. And it's essentially the number of training examples your learner needs to master a task. And in a way, the less sample complexity, the smarter your system is. So, it's important to appreciate that all machine learning until today, actually all science has ever done until today, is to work with what we quantum computing people call use classical data. Let me explain. So take a quintessential scientific instrument, like a telescope. So you look through the telescope, and then there's a stream of uh, photons coming through it. And then either, say, Galileo looks through it and does a drawing, or you take a photographic plate, you know, the photons hit it, or the James Webb telescope now has a CCD camera and takes a, a picture that you can look on your laptop. Each of these is a classical piece of data. And then you use this classical piece of data or set of data. For example, you see an astronomical object at different spots in the night sky at different times, and then you can learn the trajectory. But you recently made an amazing discovery. And jointly with scientists from Caltech, we noticed the following. If you rip out the CCD camera, so you get rid of your classical device, and you replace it by a box that can hold, let's say, some ions or some superconducting qubits that can be coherently modified or evolved under the stream of photons. And then you take a quantum processor that looks at this quantum state and you process it then amazingly, the sample complexity can be exponentially smaller than if you would have used the classical. So this sounds maybe a little dry, but it's nothing short than a sea change in science. Because essentially what this says, classical systems are simply blind to certain features of the universe. And there will be a new era of science where we will use a full quantum metrology setup to observe features. 
And uh, for example, you could turn your telescope into a dark matter detector, or we will be able to uh, build magnetometers that can monitor your heart or uh, measure features of the brain in ways that your doctor could never know. Or a consumer product that would be cool is an artificial nose that could smell viruses in the air. Wouldn't that be cool? So we uh, recently published this, was just accepted to uh, science. So if you're curious, uh, this is on the archive, and the experts among you may want to look up the details. So the, the next story, um, it's about finding signatures of agency, of free will, if you want, in high-dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, last year, uh, Stuart was so kind to invite um, my co-author, Peter Reed, and I to talk about an essay we had written uh, called Do Robots Powered by a Quantum Processor Have the Freedom to Swerve? And this paper summarizes our ideas on, from a perspective of quantum AI, how would you go about building a machine where you arguably can say that it's uh, conscious? And there's a little recipe in there, how to do this, and I'm reporting a little bit on the first steps of this recipe. But since uh, Roger Penrose just talked, I couldn't help but just stuck this slide in um, because I wanted to say the following thing about the um, Penrose Hameroff OR OR idea. I would like to propose that we generalize it and call it the generalized Penrose Hameroff conjecture. Um, what I like about their theory a lot is to say consciousness is how a system experiences the emergence of a unique classical reality. So you have your quantum mechanical wave function spread out over many classical configurations and then one selected. So I'm in state X now. So the piece I beg to change is to say, Roger, please leave gravity out of this. The reason I'm saying this, actually Roger and Stuart came once to me and said, hey, Hartmut, please compute, you know, if the OR, objective reduction mechanism, exists, would it limit the size of the quantum computers you guys can build? And we computed that if gravity would be the sole decoherence channel for a qubit, it would last 10 to the 14 seconds. That's about 3 million years. However, being in the lab every day, decoherence is the bane of our existence. Our qubits decohere after 10 to the minus 6 seconds, in microseconds, not millions of years. So, Roger Stewart, why don't we just use standard decoherence mechanisms? They decohere any system of relevance um, long before gravity gets out of bed. Yeah, so I would call this a generalized penrose hameroff conjecture. Um, little digression in response to Roger's talk. But here I want to um, tell another piece. So, how would you go about constructing a theory of consciousness? So I would say any scientific attempt to explain consciousness is tasked with reconciling the third-person perspective of science with our first-person direct experience of the world. And if that's a task, then a good point of departure is to consider situations in which these two perspectives are correlated. And here I offer the following observations. If you engage in a behavior that's conducive to your well-being, conducive to homeostasis, to use this more, this bigger word, then this tends to be correlated with feelings of pleasure. So if you eat nutritious food, you have a warm shower, a nap in cuddly blankets, the third person scientist, the doctor would say, oh, you're doing something good for your body. But you would say from your first person perspective, oh, that's tasty, oh, that feels good. And vice versa, if you engage in a behavior that threatens your homeostasis, like you get close to a fire, that's unpleasant. So how can we explain this correlation? Let's think a little bit about it. Um, I thought about it, together with my friend Peter and Tobias Rees for a long time, and I can really come up with only one straightforward, actually the only explanation. And the, this explanation is that agency or free will exist because presumably if a system had the free will to choose an outcome, do I go into this state or do I go into that state, then presumably it would pick the state that's perceived as pleasant. 
So, you know, when you are brought up in physics, like I was, you don't hear much about agency. Actually, you never hear this word. Um, but I want to tell you that despite appearances, agency is permitted by the laws of physics. And I show you that there are different layers of freedom that physics offers for systems to express agency. So the first one is maybe a little bit unexpected, that even in the Newtonian world, the clockwork world of Newton, there's room for agency. Yeah, consider the following example. You have a little child, and you put it at, set it at a table, and you present different ice creams. And the child loves vanilla ice cream. So every time you do this experiment, the child will pick the vanilla flavor. So as a third-person scientist describing the kit, you would say, hey, a deterministic law describes what you're going to do. You act like a deterministic automaton. But the child could say, good for you that you can predict, but I love vanilla ice cream. So this is an example. It's called um, compatibilism in philosophy. It is the insight that even with deterministic laws, you can still have agency. And well, let's jump over this. Let me go to the next level, quantum physics. In quantum physics, you have even more room for freedom or for agency to be present. For example, if you shoot an electron or photon towards a double slit or a multi-slit, then textbook quantum mechanics teaches us, even if I were to know all causal influences on the electron to determine what happens next, then, or physicists have a big word for it, they say, if I know the whole reverse light cone of the system, I still cannot predict what the electron is going to do next. So what more do you want for agency to um, at least have the ability to be present? And then a recent experiment we did shows that even if you go to larger quantum systems, actually to rather modest-sized larger quantum systems, then even Oh, I should have said in the piece before, quantum mechanics is often still able to give you probabilistic descriptions. So, okay, if there are two slits and they're exactly the same and experimentalists make, take great care that they're, you know, it's a very symmetric situation, so the electron doesn't really know is that, or is that better in a way than, let's say, 50-50 is the outcome, whether through this slit or through this slit. But if you go to larger quantum systems, then you cannot even do probabilistic predictions anymore. And that was the seminal results that um, my team achieved in 2019, where we used a larger quantum computer with uh, 53 qubits. And if you go to systems of that size, then it becomes impossible for classical computers to predict with which probability you will observe a certain outcome. And if I we would use our current chips that have 72 qubits, Two to the 72 probabilities is a lot of data to write down. And if you go to something like 300 qubits, it would be, you would have to recruit every single atom in the universe to act as a memory device. So in short, if you go to a system with, pick a round number, 100 qubits, you are not able to predict, in principle, um, what the probability for certain outcomes are. In such a situation as a name, it's called Knightian freedom or Knightian uncertainty. It's a situation when um, yeah, you can't even say what the probability of an outcome would be. And of course, that is, I would say, is the ultimate for agency able to exist. And I would also say this answers a question that people have answered until very recently. Is it in principle possible if you would monitor a given human like with all sensors you want? I pay very careful attention to it, monitor everything about you. Will I be able to predict what you're going to do next? I would say the answer to this is no. If a system, even a single paramecium, if under the hood there are a few molecules, and 100 qubits is not a lot, you know, one protein, to describe a single protein, you would need more than that. Yeah, so if just for a few femtoseconds you have a little quantum circuit acting there in the cytoplasm, then that's enough to create 
this situation where you have 19 uncertainty and you cannot predict what the paramecium is going to do next, and same is true for humans. So that I wanted to <laughs> establish uh, once and for all. So again, there are these different layers of uh, freedom. So of course, what about novel physics? You know, so one thought I had, hey, we have, you know, people are hunting for new forces all the time. That's the bread and butter job at the Large Hadron Collider, um, where they look for new interactions. Or astronomers say, oh, there's dark matter, there is um, dark energy. So there are new forces being postulated all the time. I feel the quantum processes that we have are sort of like the Large Hadron Collider in the complexity direction. So nobody has ever really checked whether, as a Hilbert space, for those who don't know this word, Hilbert space is a state space in quantum mechanics, and it grows exponentially with the number of qubits you have. So if you have n qubits, the Hilbert space has size 2 to the n, so it grows very, very quickly. And we have, for the first time now, humankind has the ability to carefully prepare states in this high-dimensional Hilbert space and measure them. And it's a reasonable question to ask, hey, if you go to very high dimension, I mean, quantum physics is not mass, it's physics. So it can be wrong and if in certain regimes. And if the history of science is any lesson to us, you know, like Newton developed his mechanics with certain masses and with certain velocities. And if you make the velocities much faster and the mass is much bigger, you have to go to special relativity or to general relativity, you have to update the theory. And same here, like quantum mechanics was, developed around few qubit systems. So now if the dimension of the Hilbert space is gazillion times larger, is it still valid? So I thought I would look for that. And I made some simple experiments. And I thought a good way to do an experiment is to create situations where the outcome over certain states, you know, an outcome in our machines is always a bit string. It's always a string of zeros and ones, zero, one, one, zero, something like this up to n, zero, one numbers. And then I looked at states that are called Dicke states. Here's an example. So a Dicke state is essentially the uniform superposition of all bit strings. Let's say in this case here, it's a 3, 2 Dicke state. So you have three qubits, and two of them are one. Yeah, so there are three possibilities for this. Or so a 10, 2 Dicke state would be a state but always two ones are there and the rest is zero. And you then make a quantum mechanical superposition. And you can, I like these because we can nicely prepare such states with just a small polynomial number of gates, but it's an exponential object, you know, because the n choose k states, which is a very large number, but you only need n times k gate operations in your quantum computer. So with polynomial resources, you make an exponential sized object. So that's cool. And some people um, have suggested, see a quantum circuit looks like sheet music. You know, here in the, for those of you who have never seen this, um, you have the qubits are initialized here and then you have these gate operations essentially, the um, nodes you're playing and then at the end you measure. And then ask the question, okay, if textbook-wise everything works according to quantum mechanics, then at the end I should have an equal probability over each of my um, bit strings that are contained in the Dicke state. And is that the case? And then what scientists like to do, you do a statistical test. I use the so-called chi-square test. It checks the null hypothesis. Yes, it's uniform, the probability, or no, you're far away from a uniform distribution. And then I, Tanush Katar uh, helped me with this. We ran this experiment, and ta-da, it wasn't uniform at all. So I tried to improve things and um, went to um, our experimentalist. I said, Hartmann, Hartmann, yeah, this is way too complicated, do something simpler. So I went to, to a very simple circuit that you see here. So again, we initialize our qubits in the zero state, and then we have a single gate operation. For those who don't know, a qubit can be visualized as a vector on the Bloch sphere. And essentially, this operation turns the vector into the equator, and then you measure. And then you get with, in textbook, with 50-50, 
you would get a zero or a one. Yeah, and we do this for each qubit. And then I looked, in this case, each bit configuration of four bits is equally likely. And then I tried to see, hey, in this very simple circuit, is it uniform? Did my chi-square test? No, it wasn't uniform. So of course, me, I could go out C, as I predicted, you know, there is agency. I just visit, witnessed a system expressing agency. Of course, if you're a more prosaic, hard-nosed experimentalist, you would say, no, no, Hartmut, this is just noise in our hardware. So I refined this a little bit more. I turn it around. I say, let's try to make the chi-square test happy by keeping free parameters in the system, like here these setters, so I don't rotate them exactly all the same. I rotate each qubit such that the chi-square test says, okay, for a certain number of excitations, for a certain number of ones, let's say two ones in within four, you know, it's bit strings of four, but you have two ones on, make sure that this is, the chi-square test is happy and say, hey, it's uniform. So I achieved that. You can choose your angle so that it becomes uniform. But then I just went to the neighboring situations. I went to k minus one and k plus one states. I said, is this uniform still? And again, it was not uniform. So where, what do we take from here? You know, have you vis witnessed free will in action? Or did we just witness crappy hardware? Yeah, so here's a few suspicions voiced by an amateur experimentalist myself. So the first question is indeed to ask this. How can we, I mean, pinpointing novel physics, I mean, extraordinary claims require extraordinary funding, as we heard. <laughs> so at Google, I think that's in place. So, um, but how do I discriminate between novel physics or just noise? But it, these systems are pretty special in the sense that qubits, they are sort of the most sensitive measurement instruments we have. They're just changed by a single quantum, and then a flux quantum, for example, of the magnetic field. And we have like big machinery that controls this very fragile state. So we may never be able to make this really uniform, make the chi-square test happy. So I start to think that situations that are amenable to deterministic or probabilistic descriptions as we have the hero stories in physics, they may be very well the exception. And pockets of irreducibility where you cannot just say why this was picked over this, these pockets of irreducibility may just be there. There's of course this famous thing, I think Eugene, Eugene Wigner introduced this. He was wondering, or physicists are often wondering about the unreasonable effectis, effectiveness of mass mathematics in the natural sciences in the natural sciences. And these little exercises here make me think, it's almost heretic to say, that yeah, maybe that is unreasonable. And we will actually not describe it completely well in the end. That could actually be an outcome. And there is actually an ability of a system to express preferences in ways that are not predictable to us. And the interesting thing is, that we don't even have to answer this difficult question before proceeding to exploiting this possibility. Yeah? So for example, we can just look at our system and meaning that the chi-square test was not happy and the distribution was not uniform means that there are certain states for whatever reason, deterministic physics, probabilistic quantum mechanics, describing the noise in our system, novel physics that we don't know yet. I don't know, for some reason, the system likes to go to certain states more than to others. Let's call those the happy states. And let's engineer an AI using these happy states. What happens then? Will this be noticeably different from a system that doesn't do that? And I can think of many uses of such systems, and I will not go through the list. It's in the paper if you're interested, but the interesting question or the interesting possibility we have now, uh, David Sharma said this earlier this morning, you know, we are in a moment where we can go from deep philosophy to actual 
engineering. And that's uh, the case here. Now these issues become amenable to experimental investigation. You know, can we work with systems that may have something like the ability to freely go to a happy state? Would they behave differently than the classical AI we always built so far? And Peter Reed, my co-author, he would always say, this is now the moment where we go from brain AI to mind AI. You know, interesting times. So I think I see I've only a minute, 10 seconds left. I try to be <laughs> within the time. Here's my last story. It's a, it's a short story. I can uh, cut this off. Is another motivation why neurobiology or living systems may be interested in using um, quantum resources. And that is to use it in optimization. So optimization is a bread and butter challenge for all engineers all the time. And in machine learning in particular, um, machine learning is traditionally formulated as an optimization problem. And for those of you who don't know, optimization problem can be visualized as you have an energy landscape and your task is to find a good solution, say a low cost or low energy solution, um, that's solving the optimization problem. And mathematicians know that in general these problems are what is called NP-hard. You cannot really solve them on classical computers. You probably can't solve them perfectly on quantum computers either, but you can probably solve them better by making use of what is called the, the tunneling effect. So the um, classical way to solve these problems is by steepest descent. You just randomly jump somewhere into this landscape, and then you walk down, and then you just keep going down like you would do here in the desert if you wanted to find water, and then you get to a better solution. But then you may be stuck, and you have to start somewhere else and start again and start again, because in high-dimensional landscapes, it's difficult to look over the next hill. But with quantum resources, you can just cut through these barriers and find those low-lying states more efficiently. So this is another place where it's a natural place where quantum resources may be exploited by biological systems. And I had some updates on the story, but I'm out of time and will just let this um, go. But I thought it's another important motivation why biological systems have the advantage or may have advantage from using quantum resources. So with that, I will stop and let now the real quantum neurobiologist present you new results where we may see quantum, functional quantum effects in biological systems. Thank you. Much, Hartmut, for that. It's always very inspiring presentation. So, is um, is Arad? Is he online? Uh, yes, I am online. Can you hear me? Yes, very loud, very loud, and very clear. So, Arad Kalra is a postdoctoral fellow in the Greg Schulz lab at uh, Princeton, and he previously did his PhD with uh, Jack. Tusn Tusnevsky in univer at University of Alberta. Arad, please, you have 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Professor Koch. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so a couple of years ago, um, all of us uh, got together and, and wrote a grant uh, to the Templeton Foundation uh, requesting funding to uh, to illustrate uh, whether there was something special about microtubules. So, um, were microtubules interesting in a non-trivial way? Uh, that may suggest some uh, some some quantum interactions. Uh, were microtubules similar to photosynthetic complexes? Where there has actually been suggestions of quantum interactions. Were microtubules similar to the, uh, you know, the carbon nanotubes that we that we so hear, often hear about? And so we got this grant from the Templeton Foundation. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the results, uh, the experimental results uh, 
achieved from this work um, over one year. Um, so yeah, we're we're uh, in the process of of collating these results and and writing up a paper. Um, okay, uh, and I guess I'm I'm very grateful to uh, to Professor Scholes uh, for letting me be in his lab and presenting here and and working with his wonderful team. <clears throat> So this work is a collaboration um, between five or six labs. Uh, Professor Penrose is part of it. Professor Petri is part of it. Um, Professor McIver, Professor Tuzinski, uh, and of course, Professor Hammeroff. Um, okay, so microtubules are these long slender polymers um, okay, that are present all across the cell. Um, typically when I begin uh, presenting, this is just how I, I, I begin, so you know, Microtubules are, have a cylindrical morphology, and they are made up of um, of these long columns of uh, of, a, of a globular protein called tubulin. Okay, so this is tubulin, and, and um, it's a globular protein. The tubulin exists as a dimer in our bodies. Okay, so there's alpha and beta, and um, tubulin uh, forms cylindrical microtubules. Okay, now typically, uh, okay, so tubulin dimer is eight nanometers long, four and a half nanometers wide, and six nanometers deep. Okay, typically a biologist would study uh, microtubules um, for their importance to cellular, um, for, for their importance to the mechanical properties of the cell. Okay, so they, they, they provide uh, cell shape and rigidity, microtubules do. In fact, microtubules are as uh, stiff as plexiglass. Okay, and this is why they play such, uh, such um, strong structural roles within the cell. Um, they're also crucial for cell division. So chromosomal segregation is orchestrated by microtubules. Uh, some of you may have seen the, you know, the classic metaphase spindle. That is a result of microtubules literally pulling on chromosomes mechanically. Okay. And of course, um, this is a video many of you would have seen. Uh, microtubules act as, um, as, uh, as railroads almost for the transport of macromolecules across the cell. So you have kinesins, dynins, and other motor proteins that almost walk on top of microtubules, um, carrying mitochondria and other membrane-bound organelles across the cell. Okay, and, and so these reasons are, and, and some others, are, 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 this is why a typical structural biologist or a biochemist would study microtubules, right? Um, but this is not why we study microtubules, okay? We studied microtubules. Um, okay, so so yeah, so, so, you know, a typical structural biologist would also, um, you know, yeah, so yeah, have these microtubule associated proteins that bind to microtubules um, and, and they are actually responsible for maintaining um, uh, for, for maintaining the, the health of a microtubule and allowing a microtubule to execute its tasks. A variety of drugs also bind to microtubules. Okay, so Taxol, uh, which is given as part of some chemotherapies, binds to microtubules. Colchicine binds to microtubules, destabilizing it. And so um, folks in medicine uh, often study microtubules for their interaction with drugs, okay? Again, not why we're studying microtubules. Uh, remember, we're looking for some interesting um, interesting physics over here, okay? It's not biology. Um, we are interested in microtubules, um, not for structural reasons, um, but for, for, for really um, to investigate quantum, uh, the, the, you know, the potentially, potentially quantum properties, right? And so, and so, why would why would you do that? Why would you be interested in microtubules from 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 a from a quantum standpoint? Why not study the mitochondria or DNA or the cell membrane? Why why is it only microtubules that have been singled out? You know what what is this song and dance about? Just just microtubules. Okay, so the first thing you must know is that the tubulin dimer, remember, that makes up the microtubule has an abundance of aromatic amino acids. Okay, so there's a presence of, of, of these aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan, which absorb light in the UV regime. Okay, so they absorb UV light. Okay, um, these aromatic amino acids are stacked at, at distances that are very close to each other. And when distances between aromatic amino acids are, are so close to each other, it's been experimentally shown that, that energy transfer could take place. Okay, so, so UV light absorbed from aromatic amino acid A can then be transferred to UV light, uh, can be transferred to aromatic amino acid B, um, either via UV light or through a dipole interaction or uh, maybe through an exciton 
and and through various mechanisms okay so amino acids can talk to each other aromatic amino acids can if they are stacked close enough in microtubules that is actually the case um you do have uh, aromatic amino acids that are stacked within uh, you know within a nanometer of each other in many case uh, in many cases okay third point that make my, that makes microtubules special is the presence of a lattice okay and this is really a big point so okay there are instances of, of, of aromatic amino acids being present in uh, in proteins close enough for for there to actually be some kind of excitonic behavior um close enough for there to be some quantum behavior but really the clincher with microtubules is this long range order okay microtubules have a beautifully ordered beautifully systematic arrangement that extends unbroken over often microns okay um so there's this lattice that exists in microtubules and finally microtubules are chiral okay so they're directionally polarized so one end of a microtubule is not the same as the opposite end okay they call the plus end and the minus end uh, let me see if i can okay so this is a plus end and this is the minus end okay and it's and and really it's the combination of these four reasons that makes that make microtubules um uh, interesting um to, to study even from a, from a from a photophysics uh, standpoint okay and to investigate whether there may be some non trivial uh, uh physical chemistry that's going on here okay um biologically speaking tubulin has a highly conserved amino acid sequence so the tubulin in our bodies is structurally close to tubulin um inside you know a a bird for example you know or or the tubulin inside a tree okay all right so the idea here for us to investigate is um you know when you when you're talking of 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 uh, the session is titled quantum neuroscience right so think of something crazy okay and and in, and here's the thing okay you have um you have neurons and you have you know cells in the brain every so often in a mitochondria you have these um singlet oxygens that are created okay the, and 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 triplet carbonyls that are created and when they relax back into their ground state they emit uv light okay could it be that this uv light is absorbed by microtubules okay and through energy transfer remember the repeated stacked amino acids the aromatic amino acids through repeated cycles of energy transfer this light energy this photonic energy could actually be transferred across the entire microtubule resulting in some kind of biochemical um biochemical application right at the end of it if you can show that microtubules are interesting from a photon from a photonic standpoint that would be a start towards um towards showing that microtubules are actually special so you know one has to be very careful when one begins these experiments and 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 really our first aim throughout throughout the first year of this project has been to just just investigate and explore microtubules from a photonic standpoint you know just just measure some properties find out whether what i'm showing in this cartoon here can it actually happen is it even feasible okay so uh, of course this is not the only idea uh, uh, that, that that related to the, the interesting physics of microtubules um the excitons that i showed uh, the, the aromatic amino acid excitations that i showed uh you don't need uv light in the cell right you the maybe they can also be caused by um by the binding of a drug on a microtubule remember the slide that i showed you the, showing the drugs bind to microtubules maybe a drug or a, or a, or another protein binding to a microtubule could set off a cascade of excitons uh, of these aromatic amino acid excitations within the microtubule the lattice would be very useful here, right different drugs different different proteins would bind to microtubules in a different way and 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 depending on where they bound and how they bound you'd have different patterns of excitons propagating along a microtubule so the the the, the schematic that i showed in the previous slide showing you a simple linear pattern of exciton propagation may not actually uh, happen there there have been models um, in the 80s uh, showing that you have different patterns that can generate in a microtubule and 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 the concept here is that 
you 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 so von neumann showed the different patterns in in a in a in a lattice like this that emerge can eventually lead to computing okay so what i'm get what i'm going to get as here get at here is that there are ideas that indicate that computing could take place in a microtube okay now the thing is when you do experiments on on ideas like this you have to be very careful and this is this is slow progress okay because you have to be every time you get an interesting result you have to go back and do 10 controls to make sure you know i think professor uh, dr neven actually spoke a little bit about this right you have to be very uh, you have to be very hard nosed about about interesting results you get and so every time um every time you know i am confronted with a theory like this I, my first instinct is to to be very slow and just parse out everything experimentally okay so the question we are asking of course is um, can microtubules act as channels that can process such photonic information okay and so and so answer this question uh, we decided to probe just tryptophan to start off with okay so no tyrosine no phenylalanine just tryptophan why would we do that well we do that because the quantum yield of tryptophan is the highest among the aromatic amino acids okay quantum yield is defined as the photons emitted divided by the photons absorbed by a chromophore okay uh, and that value is highest for tryptophan okay so tryptophan like i said absorbs in the uv regime so that's that's the that's the yellow curve here um we found the uh, we found tubulin conjugated to this fluorophore called amca okay it's like a coumarin derivative and the special thing about amca is that it absorbs light at 320 to 350 nanometers precisely where tryptophan emits light after having absorbed its uh, its 280 nanometers of light okay so tryptophan absorbs at 280 nanometers and emits at 320 to 350 nanometers amca absorbs at 320 to 350 nanometers okay and so this forms uh, an energy transfer pair with tryptophan okay and so like i said amca absorbs at um, at, uh, at at uh, at 320 to 350 nanometers uh it emits this light it absorbed at uh, at about 450 nanometers okay and so if you do a simple 2d uh, fluorescent spectrum you can actually show that this is true it, so when we when we when the, when we bought amca conjugated to tubulin and we polymerized microtubules using this amca conjugated tubulin not only did we get a peak here at the standard you know 350 to sort of 450 peak we also got this cross peak You see, inputting light at two eighty nanometers also led to an emission at four fifty nanometers, meaning that you could excite tryptophan and get light out of AMCA. So you wouldn't just get light out of tryptophan; you'd get light out of, out of AMCA as well. Okay, and this indicates that there has actually been energy transfer between tryptophan and AMCA. Okay, so you've 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 successfully shown. um that uh, that amca accepts energy uh, from tryptophan okay that it accepts photonic energy from tryptophan all right once we knew this we decided to perform a technique called time correlated single photon counting uh, this is familiar to folks that work in photonics it's called you know the abbreviated to tcspc okay so you have a diode um at 305 nanometers supposedly exciting tryptophan in your microtubules you have microtubules you know your microtubule solution in a cuvette uh and you detect light it emits at um at uh, you know between 320 and 350 nanometers um and you read out the time difference between the 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 uh, the light you put in and the time and the, and the light that was actually emitted by the tryptophan okay and you you have a histogram so you do this experiment you know 10000 times and you get a histogram of time delays okay you fit this histogram to three exponentials okay Um, why would you do that? You you well you fit it to three exponentials because uh, because tryptophan fluorescence has been um, has been modeled to be fit to two exponentials, okay, um, and the third one is scattering, okay. So so tryptophan exists in two conformers, um, uh, three conformers actually, which which result in two lifetimes, and and the third uh, and the third lifetime is um, is scattering. Okay, so this is why you'd fit your uh, your uh, tryptophan um, time decay. Um, curve to to three exponentials okay when you do that um you can begin 
adding a controlled amounts of amca into this into remember amca uh, amca amca um, amca accepts energy from fuse and tryptophan okay so you mix the fully amca labeled tubulin where every single tubulin dimer in the solution is labeled with amca with unlabeled tubulin where no tubulin is labeled with amca okay you mix them up and uh, you know the volumes you put in and you polymerize microtubules now depending on the volumes you put in you can essentially titrate the concentration of amca you see so you can have a microtubule that's made out you can have a microtubule solution where every microtubule is is made up of tubulins where every tubulin dimer has amca on it or you could be like okay half the tubulin dimers have AMCA, have amca on them and half don't you know one fourth have and three quarters don't or completely unlabeled where there's no amca on the in the entire solution right no microtubule has any amca on it okay and the experiment here is you 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 measure the lifetime the three fits that i showed you you measure the lifetime as a function of amca labeling ratio okay now because amca sequesters energy from tryptophan because amca accepts energy from tryptophan it is expected to drop the lifetime of tryptophan okay so the purple line here has a steeper curve and this is a shorter lifetime of tryptophan uh, this is observed when amca is actually bound uh, to the tubulin okay depending on the number of amcas you had in your microtubule on average and, and the and the um, and the lifetime you got this can allow you to to determine how far away a tryptophan can transfer energy to an amca fluorophore okay is this energy transfer distance long range that would indicate that microtubules are interesting as because so you know that would be that would basically be the photosynthesis experiment right if on the other hand um amca could only be transferred energy to uh, very once you got very close to it oh, well then maybe maybe microtubules aren't actually all that special so this is really the experiment we're doing okay <clears throat> yeah so and and so how do tryptophan lifetimes depend on microtubule biochemistry what happens when you add you know agents to it what happens when you add drugs to this what happens when you add anesthetics to it that remember switch off consciousness right okay um so i did this experiment i titrated the concentrations and i measured um uh, i measured the tryptophan lifetime it's very important to verify that you had microtubules in the first place in your solution so we we performed pem experiments um to make sure we had microtubules and we fit uh, we fit the tryptophan lifetime to three um to three experimentals um the third one i will not show because it's just scattering okay um so yes so uh, so as we as we as we increased the concentration of amca we did find uh, that the lifetimes uh, reduced you can see that in both the lifetime fits uh the dotted lines show unlabeled uh microtubules where there was no amca okay notice and this is really the first interesting result notice the gap between the unlabeled microtubules and the labeled micro and 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 the and the, and the labeled uh, and and the amca labeled microtubules notice that the amca labeled microtubules don't actually they don't saturate they don't approach the well they approach the curve but they don't they don't really meet the dotted line they don't really meet the unlabeled microtubules curve right when we repeated this exact same experiment for unpolymerized tubulin so no microtubules now we found that the that the blue line actually met the uh this actually met the uh, its counterpart the, the dotted line here the dashed line okay could this indicate that uh, that a tryptophan can quote unquote see an amca seven dimers away because this is 1/7 this concentration okay we know that it's not an averaging trend because if it was an averaging trend gdp tubulin would also show the same graph right because gdp tubulin saturates to the to the you see this asymptotic line because gdp tubulin saturates to the dashed line and microtubules don't saturate to the dashed line this means a tryptophan can tell the difference between an amca bound to seven dimers away versus an amca not bound at all that means it can quote unquote 
C the AMCA seven dimers away. And by and by C, you know, more, more precisely, I mean it can transfer energy to it. Okay. Could this indicate some kind of long range energy transfer? So to quantify this, um, I, I fit it to what's called a stern volmer uh, equation. And you can see the clear differences between the blue line and, and, the, and the red line here. Um, the quenching rate constant uh, for, uh, for GDP to be then was uh, one and a half uh, roughly uh, times a picosecond versus microtubules that were getting quenched uh, about more than four times uh, a, a picosecond. Okay. Um, all right. So, so when you have this result, uh, you know, one of the questions I asked was, um, okay, if this really is long range energy transfer, right? Then, uh, then changing the microtubule morphology would actually alter trip defined lifetimes. It is long range, right? So what if um, normally a microtubule has 13 protofilaments, right? So it has 13 columns of tubulin. And these columns are linear, right? What if I, I formed a 14 protofilament microtubule? The 14 protofilament microtubule has a kinked lattice. Okay, so this is at an angle. So it, it's not actually straight, right? Notice, notice that the 13 protofilament microtubule is straight. It's, it's, uh, it's vertical, whereas the 14 protofilament microtubule is at an angle, okay? If short range energy transfer were taking place, if for example, uh, you know, you know, AMCA was just was just uh, accepting energy from from tryptophan that was on the same tubulin dimer. Then changing the large scale morphology of a microtubule may not have had a very dramatic effect on the lifetime, right? And so this was the, the rather simple idea that I had, and I decided to uh, to test it out. Uh, so once again, you form your fourteen protofilament microtubule. They are they formed using Instead of using GTP, you use this a slowly hydrolyzable analog called GMP CPP. Okay, um, and you you know you do the whole lifetime experiment once again, fit it to two exponentials, and now we see something interesting. We see that uh, the, un the 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 unlabeled where there's no AMCA present, the dashed lines uh, are different in the purple case. So 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 the dashed lines in the in the in the in the GMP CPP, the 14 protofilament microtubules show a lower lifetime than the 13 protofilament microtubules, right? Interestingly enough, it was only the unlabeled case that was different. You see, when I when I labeled, when I added labeled tubulin and I did the same experiment with labeled tubulin, you can see how the how the red and the and the and the purple lines seem to overlap. Well, at least the error bars do, right? That indicates that the difference may not actually be significant. The only potentially significant result is really the unlabeled case. Okay. Now remember, remember I showed um, that that in thirteen protofilament microtubules, there's a non-saturating trend. Uh, I showed that uh, you have um, the, the, the 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 one in seven labeling ratio doesn't quite uh, overlap with the unlabeled labeling ratio. It turns out that in a 14 protofilament microtubule, they actually do overlap. You see how the purple line that is dashed actually meets the non-dashed line in both cases, in both lifetimes, while the 13 one didn't. This indicates that in a 14 protofilament microtubule, this long range behavior is absent, right? Or at least it's shorter range. Let, let me be precise. It's actually shorter range, okay? And when you quantify this um, through, through, you know, a stern Waldner plot, uh, we find that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 1.3 for tubulin uh, per picosecond, 4.2 for, uh, for microtubules, and 3.7 for, uh, for, for a 14 protofilament. So it is lower. Um, however, it's, it's, it, as an aside, it's interesting to notice that, uh, that, these, that these lifetime trends um, seem to saturate at, 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 a, you know, at, a, at a labeling ratio of almost one is to three, right? Um, whereas this shows differences that are 4.2 um, and 3.77. So maybe not that dramatic, actually. Right. And what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to determine the exciton diffusion length. So, uh, so you know, um, how, how um, how far away does does a does a does a does a does an excited tryptophan uh, 
uh, how far away can it transfer the excitation to before it diffuses? Be be sorry, before it quenches, before it before it dies out, essentially. Okay. Now, of course, the big question: Could anesthetic? Arad, um, could you please, uh, because we're running late, could you please uh, wrap it up in the next slide or so? Of course. Um, Okay, so the big question is, can anesthetics alter uh, tryptophan amp interactions, right? So anesthetics block consciousness, allowing us to, allowing us to study uh, how, how they work. Um, this long-range interaction, what do anesthetics have to do with it? Could they, could adding anesthetics change this interaction? Um, all right, I'll just, let me just skip this. Out. All right, so you repeat the same experiment as anesthetics. And um, so we, we tried out two uh, two dramatically different anesthetic. We found an etomidate, which is which is a short acting um, intravenous anesthetic, and isoflurane, which is which is an inhaled anesthetic. And we found that um, that they didn't affect unlabeled microtubules, but when you added AMCA to the solution in the presence of the anesthetic, remember they dampened the effect that that AMCA had on tryptophan. Okay. What I'm trying to say is shorter range interactions were seen when anesthetics were present, whereas longer range interactions were seen when they weren't present. So anesthetics dampened AMCA tryptophan interactions. The rate constants were dramatically lower. You can see that it's the KQ values are three, three and a half times a picosecond versus four, four and a half times a picosecond for a, for a, for a 13 protofilament microtubule. Okay, and so the two takeaway messages are uh, 13 and 14 protofilament microtubules are, are different uh, from a photonic standpoint, uh, suggesting there is uh, some long-range energy transfer, and anesthetics dampen interactions between uh, AMCA and, uh, and and tryptophan. Once again, suggesting that they can they can mediate exciton transfer in microtubules. Um, I'd like to thank the Scholes group. Uh, I would not have been able to do the experiments that I have without their uh, explicit support. Uh, they have been a wonderful. Princeton is a wonderful atmosphere to work in, and I'd like to thank the Templeton Foundation for funding our work. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and see you in a bit at the at the joint uh, discussion. I'd like to introduce the, the third speed, uh, speaker this afternoon, Aristide Dugario. He's a professor of uh, of optics at the University of uh, Central Florida, working at the interface of optical biophysics and electromagnetism. Aristide, please, you have uh, yeah. 25 minutes. All right. Thank you for, for the introduction. Let me uh, just uh, try to, do you see my screen? Yes. All right, so uh, I, will, uh, I will try to, uh, to get down to uh, some of the uh, nuts and bolts of uh, how uh, these uh, unlocalized global states might be created in, uh, in structured matter, such as a uh, microtubule. Uh, as, uh, as you know, the, uh, and, and actually the uh, nuts and bolts that I'm really referring to, they will have a very strong uh, uh, physical origin. What I'm concern, uh, interested in, uh, in actually uh, making a little summary for you here for a number of, uh, of situations that, uh, that would uh, probably challenge the, uh, the uh, common uh, way of uh, looking at, uh, at uh, biological interactions. And uh, the summary in this, uh, on, this, uh, on this particular slide, the, the takeaway from this, uh, this particular slide is that uh, there are certainly situations in which we could not ignore phenomena such as synchronization, long range interaction between uh, biological uh, As Keith, is there a way you can switch to presenter mode? If you can Excuse just me? switch the windows. Oh, you are on the... Yeah, we I see understand. multiple slides. You see... Uh... Yeah. 
Now do you Yeah, see? this is good. All right, sorry for that. Sorry for that. So, uh, yes, um, what I was talking about is that uh, there are situations in which we could not ignore the fact that uh, uh, entities of a complex system interact over long ranges. Therefore, they may experience synchronization type of phenomena and uh, all sorts of uh, other type of consequences. Of course, the, uh, this kind of a signaling can be supported by, uh, by different means, electrons, ions, and so on and so forth, phonons, photons as well. And the, uh, out of these, the electromagnetic type of signals are certainly the fastest, therefore more interesting. However, they are the least uh, understood. And uh, one uh, very well, uh, well represented uh, situation that, uh, that we're all familiar with are these uh, so-called uh, active materials, active matter that manifests at very different scales. And this, uh, this uh, manifestation of different phenomena across scales is actually what I would like to, uh, to point out in, uh, in, my, uh, in my talk uh, today. So uh, what are these uh, active, uh, active media, right? They are complex systems. They are subject to a lot of influences and a lot of interactions between, uh, between parts of different origin, hydrodynamic, electrostatic, electromagnetic, and so on and so forth. The uh, bottom line and the, uh, the common aspect of all of these, uh, of these manifestations is that I would say that the effective size of a system is determined by the type of interactions between them. And that will, uh, will actually uh, reverberate across uh, different, uh, different aspects uh, during, during this. So they, they, uh, another aspect, aside from this scale-less manifestations of many, of many phenomena, is the fact that these systems are usually in a uh, non-equilibrium steady state, which modifies all the uh, all the uh, observable uh, ways, modifies the way we, we look at the consequences of this uh, massive interaction. Let's start with a very simple uh, a simple uh, situation of uh, an electromagnetic field that is incoherent. And it acts randomly on a uh, elementary piece of matter. This can be a molecule, this can be a, a bead, this can be a larger object. The question is, if I have two of these, how do they interact? Not going to go through this math. But the fact is that if you go rigorously to the math and take all the, all the averages into account, two objects placed at a distant uh, or in, a, in an incoherent field, they will interact surprisingly in a long range manner. So they will be like, uh, they, they, these two objects, they, they, will, uh, they will behave like uh, they, they will be affected each other through some kind of a mock gravity. This coming back to, uh, to what we heard uh, before about the, uh, the role of gravity is not important the magnitude of the force. It is important the range of the interaction between, between elements. This is what actually, uh, this is what actually describes the uh, consequences of a massive many body interaction in a complex system like this. The, uh, the range of interaction between, uh, between points. So this is an example that uh, we have uh, we have demonstrated of a uh, all all active all all uh, optical uh, active medium in which there is a massive interaction between elements, very very nano nano sized particles displaced in an incoherent three dimensional field. As the coupling between the field that matter evolves the matter itself starts to manifest super diffusive behavior. 
it's like the an, an effective temperature increase. What's more, this uh, effective temperature at which the matter uh, exists can be tuned by adjusting the, uh, the potential that is imposed on the matter by, the, uh, by this uh, external field. And uh, now, is this really observable in the, in the biological world? I will just show you a very few examples. We don't have much time. A few examples that, uh, that we have observed in the, in the lab that uh, might have some, uh, some connection to these uh, physical, uh, physical uh, situations that I, uh, that I uh, showed you before. So these are cells which are exposed to electromagnetic field and uh, the, uh, their internal activity is, is practically tested by, uh, by looking at the uh, fluctuations of this uh, acting labeled, uh, labeled uh, subunits. And the cells, by the way, they are actually in a, in, a, in a natural, dense cellular environment. And as you can see, the activity of this uh, is certainly changing in, in time. So, 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 so this effective massive uh, uh, reaction to the electromagnetic field is, uh, is time dependent. Certainly, it's, uh, it's uh, dose dependent, but most interestingly, there is some incipient observation here that it might be also uh, polarization dependent. So as soon as I say the, the word polarization in a, in a context like this, I move towards a coherent effect, coherent consequence of, uh, of the electromagnetic field on this uh, cellular activity. To make it even clearer, let me show you this. So this is an experiment in which we are actually changing in time, in a very long time, the direction of polarization. And as you can see, the cells actually really evolve in time depending upon the direction of the electromagnetic field that was applied to them. And to not... Uh, not uh, think about any kind of very strong uh, direct mechanical effect of the light on, on these cells, the level of irradiance that, uh, that these phenomena were observed is very low. It's basically at the level of uh, a very uh, a trivial uh, microscope exposure. So this is practically close to the, uh, to the natural uh, sunlight, right? Sunlight would be 10 to the third uh, watts per, per square meter in here. Similar things in uh, three-dimensional geometries. You know, most of the biology is on a, on a flat uh, landscape. Well, this is why most of the studies might not be so relevant to real life. So if you are to, to look into, into this kind of, uh, for instance, uh, Schwann cells, right? So you, we created a, an, an environment that is really specific to their natural habitat. So, we, we looked at the same type of phenomena in a, in a, in a cylindrical geometry to, uh, to examine pretty, pretty much the same, the same, the, the mobility of them, they become certainly dependent on the, uh, on the uh, geometrical as well as the, uh, as the excitation properties in this complex field. Coming back to the, to the problem at hand, we will, I'm going to try to to show you a few examples of how how uh, this uh, remarkable structure of the uh, of the uh, microtubules that uh, Arat was describing in in detail before how 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 this uh, this uh, structure leads to scale dependent manifestations of the of the interaction with uh, with the electromagnetic field some kind of interesting. Uh, coherent responses and synchronization, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But before anything, I would like to make sure that uh, I, I define what I mean by cooperativity in this, in, this, uh, in this context. So cooperativity, meaning that one element 
behaves differently by itself behaves differently when is a uh, when its position with respect to the other elements matters or when indeed the uh, initial the, the the intrinsic response of it actually depends on the collectivity so this is a massive many body effect that uh, that that we call uh, a cooper cooperative response of, of individual elements so this is to uh, a, a a representation of uh, to, to quote uh, Phil Anderson that more is very different than uh, than uh, independent units so we are going towards uh, an understanding of the global global uh, global electromagnetic phenomena as, as opposed to uh, to uh, very very individual response. Let, let me let me show you a few examples of these uh, of these uh, local uh, cooperativity. So we have the, the same amount of matter. It doesn't really matter how 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 large the ensemble is, but it's exactly the same uh, the same amount of of matter, but is distributed differently. So the little interactions and the global states that are created they are different the local density of states this is a measure of how a field is distributed within this uh, macroscopic uh, piece of matter is very different so it's the same amount of matter leading to a local what we call local uh, distribution of the density of states a similar thing happens in uh, in uh, scale-less structures. We heard in uh, in uh, uh, Sir Rogers' uh, talk about uh, the styling or or his uh, quasi crystals. So this is exact a, a, a counterpart in a in a random arena of uh, structure of matter. Right in a fractal system like this, the manifestation of the uh, cooperativity depends on this scalar structure. Even a, uh, a trivial phenomena of uh, transport through a structure like this depends on the, uh, on the actual uh, interaction between, between the units. A, uh, this is a display of, of this uh, weak localization that actually depends on the, uh, on the structure. Similarly, I could go uh, on and on we have uh, we have looked at uh, transmission eigen channels through systems like this when different phases of uh, of transport develop this is really uh, similar to uh, to evolution of a uh, of a state in a, in a time uh, time dependent uh, uh, as described by a time dependent uh, schrodinger equation leading to non-stationary statistics all of these things are displays of the uh, cooperativity global cooperativity between between the matter again this is another example where we have exactly the same amount of matter but is packed differently that opens up new channels of communications between right between left and right transmission channels right so ohm's law that the uh, the, uh, the common Ohm's law is modified because of this uh, cooperative uh, interaction. And this is true not only for, for photons, also for electrons and so on and so forth. But what is more interesting and uh, to, to, for, 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 for our purposes are dynamic manifestations of this cooperativity. So let's suppose we have the system, we excite it, and then we look at the secondary emission after this excitation has left the medium right so this is this is the thing but if i start the same process with a state in which in, in which a, a steady state interaction has been established in other words the medium has been excited for a very long time and then i very quickly shut off the system the initial state for the interaction is very different now. As you can see, it's exactly the same situation, but because of this massive interaction that happened before the emission started, the initial conditions are very different. 
probably it's easier to, to actually see here, is the same source buildup when a short pulse excites. This is a full democracy in, uh, in terms of excitation of the, of, the, uh, of the medium. Here is not. Here it was initially in steady state and then, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the excitation was, uh, was, was removed the initial conditions for the emission are very different. Okay, and so what? Well, this cooperative emission leads to some quite interesting phenomena. So depending upon this cooperativity strength, you can generate in time emission that if you, if you would take only one emitter, its decay time would be indicated as, as indicated by this uh, dashed uh, black line. That would be the uh, the lifetime of one emitter, the decay rate for one emitter. However, due to this collectivity, at very short times, a super radiant, much faster, super radiant, much faster than than uh, than individual emission emission uh, occurs. If you wait long enough. At the uh, at the large uh, large scales in in time, then the emission rate decreases, and we reach the so-called subradiant domain in which the uh, the decay rate is much slower than an individual one. So energy is practically stored in here, and uh, and it's emitted and it's re-emitted much uh, much slower. What is more is that. This super radiant part points forward, and the sub radiant emit emission actually points backwards in this uh, in this thing. And I'm I'm going to show you a few examples. Probably I'm not going to go through the technicality of how we explain this in terms of quasi modes, electromagnetic energy that is stored in modes associated with the structure that are leaky modes, right? Because emission occurs continuously. This is an, an open system that actually releases energy after being charged, right? We charge the system, we have an excitation pulse, the pulse goes away, and then the medium releases the energy that has been stored in these so-called quasi-modes. The distribution of the quasi-modes it's, it's another interesting, uh, interesting aspect, but I'm not going to get into this. So let's look a little bit at the space-time fingerprint for different cooperativity strength. The cooperativity strength is here actually measured by this uh, average separation distance in terms of, uh, of uh, in units of, uh, of the wavelength, right? It's, as you can see that uh, the... Uh, at different times, red, blue, and, and green, at different emission times, the emission happens in, with, a, with a different angular distribution, meaning that, like you see here, initially the emission was in the forward direction, but then slowly, slowly, the directional, memo, a directional memory of the incidence develops. So in time, the emission becomes predominantly backward because this is the direction from where the uh, the excitation was was actually imposed onto the medium. And if you look carefully at this animation here, you will see actually something. Another very interesting aspect is this beating between the subradiant modes that that have a very long lifetime. This is a a uh, a clear. Uh, consequence of the uh, of the coherence that develops between these uh, these uh, quasi modes another example is is shown here so you see if you excite along along uh, let's do this again let me do this again all right it doesn't play that that's fine so in in time in time the the emission goes from initially as you excite a medium like this, certainly you will have some transmission peak, you will have some reflection peak, the specular reflection. 
But in time, if we wait long enough, all of these die, and most of the energy actually goes towards the uh, the backward uh, the backward directions and so. More details I can uh, I can certainly provide. You can find it in this uh, in this uh, recent uh, recent paper. The bottom line is in these two figures that uh, if you wait long enough, the energy that has been stored and is releasing from the from the medium in the in the sub radiant uh, regime maintains a memory of the uh, of the excitation so so this new paradigm actually provides a way to uh, to probably uh, control the storage and the release of energy in uh, in, in in this kind of a complex media and uh, the uh, the the conjuncture is that uh, a mechanism like this could be actually uh, uh, used in nature to uh, to to store and release energy in uh, structured media such as a uh, a microtubule. So we have looked for some time now at the uh, electromagnetic properties of these uh, of these microtubules, how uh, the the type of resonances that that occur. The type of uh, coupling between emitters and uh, and uh, and their environment and so on and so forth. In terms of this uh, space-time fingerprint, this is one example. This is one microtubule. On the on the bottom left here, you have one microtubule. Immediately after the excitation was released, it emits like a you know like a like a long rod more or less isotropically. However, if you wait long enough, the energy that is released after 30 lifetimes of one independent uh, tubulin unit, you see that actually it, it, it has a high directionality. And what's more, this directionality depends on the structure of the microtubule in terms of the, the length here. So you have an example here on, on how this uh, emission pattern of a certain time after 100, uh, 100 uh, lifetimes of, uh, of tubulin, for instance, so which means a very long time, the emission pattern has a very uh, a specific distribution uh, depending on the, uh, on the size of the structure. And not only that, if you see on the uh, on the far left column, the the actual decay itself depends on the length of this uh, of this microtubule. Most interestingly, are these uh, are these oscillatory behavior in the uh, in the emission of the microtubule, which is again a uh, a uh, signature of this uh, massive synchronization that happens in the uh, in the microtubules. Microtubules are dynamic, uh, dynamic beasts, right? They are not uh, just simply rods like uh, I would like to be to do the experiments on them, right? They, they, they have a dynamic evolution. The, uh, the ends of these uh, exquisite structures change in time. So if you model this as being a defect, you will see that practically that affects quite significantly the. Uh, the uh, the emission pattern so that that means that the way the microtubule emits or perceives uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation may even change during its natural lifetime so to speak the lifetime of a microtubule right the microtubule is a dynamic structure during this dynamics that happens that 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 uh, that is characterized by quite long time scale the uh, the emission pattern actually changes according to that. So so this this, this can be actually an an intrinsic clock, if you want, of the uh, of the microtubule evolution. What's more is that uh, this subradiant behavior is actually uh, a very robust robust feature. If you uh, if you just start to damage the microtubule, because of this massive collective behavior between the uh, the uh, enormous number of, uh, of elements that, that contribute to the emission, the fact that you damage a few here and there doesn't matter very much, 
right? You see here that uh, actually this is a, another manifestation of this uh, uh, coherent uh, synchronization, right? So, so damaging the microtubules here and there doesn't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't do much. So therefore, we can uh, conjuncture that uh, a structure like this could very well function like a um, a meter receiver, right? Like a radio, like has been demonstrated with uh, actually the the artificial counterpart of this of a structure like this is certainly a uh, nanotube, right? A um, a carbon nanotube that uh, on top of that has this kind of a helical helical symmetry. I'm not gonna have time to get into that the details and the consequences of the helicity, but uh, but certainly that uh, that actually has a unique role in uh, in the way it acts both mechanically and uh, and uh, and uh, electromagnetically. Aristide, could you, you please expand uh, this come to, uh, to the to, uh, um... larger can you please come to the end of your presentation? I will, uh, I will try. I will try. Just a few. Right. Uh, we can get to uh, higher constructs that, uh, that will resemble quite closely uh, antennas. This is a typical uh, L-shaped antenna that, that is uh, tunable by the, uh, by the gap that, uh, that could uh, develop naturally into, you know, in a centrosome. Therefore, it is plausible that uh, a, uh, a centrosome in a cell may act like uh, like it was uh, hypothesized like a rudimentary uh, rudimentary form of a uh, of a cellular uh, vision uh, mechanism for for a cell and now because uh, we will not have too much time I've been summoned on uh, on time just very very briefly what can we really measure? Because it's good to model, good to understand, but it's also good to actually demonstrate practically. Uh, so what can be measured? We can measure lifetimes. We can measure this kind of a delayed luminescence from, uh, from, uh, from microtubules. Let me, let me show you, let me just go back to straight to the, to the, to the meat of the, uh, the final slide. So this is actually those subradiant manifestations of, uh, of uh, emission from microtubules in a dispersed manner. So this is the same amount, the black curve, the same amount of tubulin monomers in a dispersed fashion or in a structured fashion in, uh, in, uh, in microtubules. As you can clearly see that the, uh, first of all, the emission per tubulin increases, a signature of a, uh, of a coherent phenomenon, and also that the effective lifetime increases. That uh, that is also a uh, a manifestation of this uh, thing. So I I'll be happy to to discuss more. Certainly, uh, you see here in the in the upper 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 side that uh, that actually another clear demonstration that the lifetime depends on the size of the microtubules. You can look at the emission from the system as the microtubules grow due to a uh, a ramp in, in temperature and and so on and so forth. And with this, I will just try to take a moment to, to summarize everything. I try to uh, show a few manifestations of collective effects, collective electromagnetic effects in, uh, in dense uh, ensemble of uh, oscillators that uh, manifest very specific space-time fingerprint in both stationary conditions and in uh, dynamic conditions, specifically for this uh, for this type of uh, uh, structured uh, structured uh, matter, which is uh, this uh, particular case of the of the microtubules. At least in this particular case, more is way different than uh, than a single. Uh, a single elementary units, and uh, we believe that this can be pot potential uh, mechanism that uh, that uh, could uh, could explain uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, unique uh, reaction of the uh, of the biological structures to either to, to both actually endogenous and exogenous uh, exogenous fields. And with this, 
I want to I want to thank uh, these guys of uh, these uh, these uh, members of my uh, my group that actually uh, contributed to uh, to this last part of the uh, of the research that I that I showed you the uh, the funding agencies and uh, and you for your uh, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for trying to keep on time because we're trying to save time for having a, for having a discussion at the end. So the, the fourth and, and final speaker is uh, Travis Craddock. He's an pro, um, associate professor in the Department of uh, Psychology, Neuroscience, uh, Computer Science and Clinical Immunology, I believe, in Nova Southeastern University in uh, Fort Lauderdale in Florida. So you also have 25 minutes and then we'll go to questions. All right, I'll try and go a little faster to make up. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Uh, so like Christoph said, I, I work at uh, Nova Southeastern University in Florida. Um, it's nice to be here. The weather's roughly the same temperature, but it's really, really dry. Uh, I work at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine at Nova Southeastern, where uh, our mission is to find uh, novel treatments and diagnostics for illnesses that have a neuroinflammatory component. Um, but before I get too far into my talk, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the conference. Uh, especially, I want to thank uh, Stuart and Abby for all their help. Uh, you know, it, it's always an honor to come and, and speak here. I'd also like to thank, uh, yeah, give me a hand. I'd also like to thank the, the funding agencies that supported this work, uh, primarily through uh, Nova Southeastern University, uh, an Army Research Office Award, and uh, some private funding from the Gateway Institute for Brain Research, uh, and my collaborators on this work. Uh, as well as all the simulations that you see that I'm going to be talking about were run on the uh, computational platform at the University of Miami. Okay, so what is uh, quantum biology? So we've, we've heard a little bit about it th this morning. Um, th there's certain key areas that, that, that are coming out now. It's been about, uh, since about 2007, where this has really moved into the mainstream after some very important work done by the Greg Engels group in the University of Chicago. Um, there are four main key areas that, that are highly recognized. Uh, you know, reaction mechanisms in enzyme catalysis, uh, where uh, electron tunneling can play a role in speeding up uh, 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 catalysis processes. Uh, sensory signal signaling, uh, so the measurement of uh, smell. Uh, this is primarily worked by Luca Turin, uh, who looks at uh, not, not only the shape of a molecule, but more the vibrational characteristics of the molecule is what the, the olfactory system is actually registering. Uh, the photosynthetic energy capture system, the light harvesting system, uh, there's been a lot of debate about whether that is a quantum system or not, uh, but you know, the, the, the jury's still out on that, but it is a very promising uh, tact on how plants are so efficient at uh, uh, gathering light and converting it to chemical energy. And then finally, uh, one of the ones that, that's more bizarre, but it's the, uh, the encoding of, of information in a, a radical pair mechanism, and this is recognized in, in the avian compass, uh, which is, is set up in the bird's eye, apparently. Uh, that, that wasn't disparaging, but that's just what I know. It, it's supposed to be set up in the eye for, for a way for that the, the birds can actually see the magnetic field and be able to navigate. Uh, now, Jennifer Brooks put, put out a paper about this a little while ago and pointed out a common characteristic about all these, these mechanisms, is that they're all processes that may, may be under, understood in terms of a rate, and they're all uh, biosystems that consist of a special pigment molecule, uh, such as a, a small non-protein molecule like a ligand, odorin, or flavin type uh, um, chromophore in a greater protein environment. And it's looking at how that key molecule uh, can interact in that environment and you, you can treat the molecule itself as a quantum system and the remainder of the, the bulk protein as a, uh, as a classical system. Now, these areas are widely recognized, in, at least in the field of quantum biology, in warm, wet, noisy systems, in the bird's eye, in photosynthesis, in enzyme catalysis, why not in the brain? Okay, and that's why you know this is a this is a section on quantum neuroscience. Uh, now we've heard from Arat about the microtubule cytoskeleton. Uh, these are some uh, uh, um, uh, drawings of what the microtubule cytoskeleton looks like uh, within the cell. Uh, there's a great paper here. This is by Leterrier. It came out uh, in 2021. It's a pictorial history of the neuronal cytoskeleton. And there's many great images, not only hand-drawn, but also a lot of uh, micrographs and, and uh, fluorescence imaging. 
Uh, from where I come from, where it's important for me is looking at the role of microtubules in neurodegeneration, such as in Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So trying to understand the fundamental, fundamental mechanisms of microtubules, if we understand how they behave within biology, we can also understand how they behave within dysfunctional biology and perhaps correct that and find novel treatments or ways to diagnose these illnesses. Again, we heard from a rat that uh, tubulin on the left there is a, a heterodimer made up of an alpha tubulin and a beta tubulin. And these things stick end to end to form a strand called a protofilament. And the protofilament sticks sideways laterally and wrap around to form a, a hollow tube. Now, these things are on the scale of, uh, they have an inner diameter of roughly 15 nanometers and an outer diameter of roughly uh, 20 nanometers or 25 nanometers. And so they're effectively a nanoscale uh, uh, a protein structure. So it's a nanostructure. Now, uh, in looking at how to understand biology, we tend to look at what we understand about uh, non-biological systems. And the closest analog to this is the multi-walled carbon nanotube. So we heard uh, uh, Aristide speak about this earlier, but uh, the multi-walled carbon nanotube uh, ranges around the same size scale, so the same diameter. Uh, they have similar tensile properties, I believe, uh, and then they can uh, go along the same lengths of, uh, of a um, microtubule within the cell. So much so that they use multi-walled carbon nanotubes as biomimetics uh, inside cells. So you can put in multi-walled carbon nanotubes within a cell, and they enhance the production and assembly of microtubules, kind of acting like a um, prosthetic microtubule. So one of the goals in nanotechnology is to use these structures to mimic biology, but likewise, we should be able to look at what are they doing to look at these nanomaterials to look at actual biology, and that's what I want to talk to you about, is certain modeling uh, uh, efforts that we've looked at on how to understand the uh, microtubule structure. And I want to talk to you specifically about exciton transfer, which is what a rat was talking about, uh, super radiance, which is what Aristide was talking about, and then some of our more recent work, which is talking about phanoresonant properties in microtubules. We heard from a rat that we were looking primarily at the uh, tryptophan uh, aromatic amino acid network. Uh, we heard about how special tryptophan is. It's uh, made up of a, an, an indole ring. Uh, it fluoresces. It absorbs energy around 280 nanometers uh, and then emits within the uh, near UV uh, 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 ultraviolet, uh, the violet spectrum, so the far violet spectrum into the, into the ultraviolet. Uh, it has a strong uh, transition dipole, and what that means is when one of these aromatic rings absorbs energy, the electrons in the ring, they shift to accommodate that new energy, and then the, pro or the, uh, the amino acid, the atoms in that slightly shift as well. And that shift of the electrons and of the atoms gives rise to what's known as a transition dipole moment. And that transition dipole can be felt by surrounding neighbors around it. And it's that transition, that shift, is what allows the communication between neighboring uh, tryptophan uh, within a tubulin dimer. So zooming in on a single uh, tubulin protein, that's what we see on the left, highlighted in blue there are the individual tryptophan molecules that are in a, a, a given tubulin uh, dimer. And if we strip away, strip away the bulk protein, what we're left there is the, is the network of aromatic amino acids that we've been talking about. And those are the spacings between each of the individual tryptophans in, on the order of uh, angstroms. And so what we can see is that we have kind of this setup of a doublet on the far left between tryptophan 8 and tryptophan 6, a doublet in the middle between tryptophan 7 and tryptophan 4, and then a doublet on the right between tryptophan 2 and tryptophan 3. And those all lie along the surface of the microtubule. So the surface of the microtubule is the top of the page, and the interior of the microtubule is down at the bottom. We just have those two floaters down there, tryptophan 1 and tryptophan 5. Now, if we look at how those transition dipoles interact with one another, how strong they couple uh, together, we get uh, this diagram here, and I think Arad had shown that uh, previously. And we see this strong coupling between those doublets and weaker coupling between uh, the, the remaining uh, sets of, of tryptophan. And we believe that's important in, in some regard. And then if you consider this to uh, go along the length of the microtubule, this pattern would repeat you know, uh, regularly along the, the length of the the protofilament. Now what we did was, is this setup here is almost an, uh, identical to, not, not in the, the, the shape of it uh, or in, or in the, the molecule, but in the, the energetics and in the spacing, 
It's very similar to the light harvesting complex in photosynthesis. So at the time that we were studying this, we took the formalism that they were using to study the ultra uh, efficient energy transfer of light harvesting and photosynthesis and we applied it to uh, a given tubulin uh, uh, dimer. And we, we evaluated the, the dynamics of a single excitation or an exciton dynamics. And so what we did is we, we would excite one single tryptophan within that network and then let it evolve in time and see what the probability was of finding it on one of the other tryptophans within the network over time. This is a quantum evolution following uh, Schrodinger's equation, and it's modified uh, using the method of Hawking and Strobel so that there's energetic disorder on each of the, of the tryptophan sites to mimic uh, interaction with the, with the thermal environment. And on the right there, you see two examples of uh, population dynamics. Uh, in the top one there, we're, we're exciting tryptophan 2, and then uh, as it decays in time, uh, it starts to oscillate with tryptophan 3. So it's sharing the energy with, between tryptophan 2 and tryptophan 3, and then over time that energy is decaying. On the bottom, you also see that some of those other uh, uh, chromophores are rising up. And what that means is that it's not only shared between tryptophan 2 and tryptophan 3, but it's also, there's a, an increasing degree of probability of finding it on some of those other tryptophans within the network. Now this oscillating pattern is, is, has been called quantum beats, and this was the hallmark of the Engels group to identify uh, a quantum effect within the photosynthetic light harvesting system. So we conjectured that, that we were having a similar uh, a related phenomenon happening within a, a given tubulin dimer. We then went on uh, to look at, well, what, what does this mean? So we, we have these things oscillating around. The, the energy can be shared across the, the, the tubulin dimer, but we're not interested in one tubulin dimer. We're interested in an entire microtubule. So again, if we look at, here's a, a patch of a microtubule on the left, and if we strip away the protein, we see the channels of tryptophan that go down the length of those, those protofilaments. And so we decided to model that same excitation on uh, a single protofilament in, in the, the, this first iteration. Instead of looking at the whole microtubule, we decided to look at how far would the energy transfer down a single protofilament. And this was work that I did with um, uh, um, Philip Curian uh, a little while ago. And what you see here is, is our model, we had several parameters that were not fully determined. Uh, they were bounded, but we didn't know which, which values to choose. And so instead of you know, trying to f fiddle around and figure out which one it was, we just modeled all of them. And what you can see there is that the, uh, on the bottom along the x-axis is how far that excitation traveled in units of dimers. So the central dimer, which was initially excited, is uh, a zero. And then where it drifted is how many to the right or how many to the left. And what you can see there is, is that you know, roughly, uh, depending on the parameters, you can get, get the uh, excitation to range between, you know, two dimers uh, in very conservative estimates or down to about 12 dimers, depending on how, how loose you get with those parameters. And right somewhere in the middle there, we're looking at around seven, seven, six, seven dimers, which is what we've heard from a rat in his uh, experimental evidence. Now, the thing that's interesting here that, um, that wasn't indicated in a rat's experiments and something I'd like to see if we could figure out at some point is that there's a directionality. You see that those things shift to the right, and it means that that excitation prefers to travel from the positive end of the microtubule down to the negative end. And so there's, there's a preferred direction in which, case, in which way the, uh, the excitation wants to go. Uh, continuing along with, with working with, with uh, uh, Philip Curian, I started working with uh, Lucas Salardo down in, in Mexico, and we started to try and think, well, we're not, we don't want to look at a single excitation here because this is assuming that that, that energy gets absorbed by one uh, tryptophan molecule and then spreads to the rest of the system. But when you consider the system, the wavelength of, a, uh, of an individual packet of, of UV light is on the order of 280 nanometers. And if you look at the length of the microtubule, you would have many, many, many tryptophan molecules in there that could be excited by that one photon. And this gives rise to these ideas of collective effects. So when you have a group of emitters that are interacting with a common light field, they can uh, behave collectively. And if the, this, this primarily occurs when the wavelength of light is much longer than the individual spacing between uh, individual emitters, or in this case, individual tryptophans. Uh, in the case where that, that energy is um, 
uh, being emitted at a higher rate. Uh, you heard uh, uh, Aristide speak about it. That's where we're talking about a super radiant effect. So it enhances the decay rate, but it also enhances the intensity of the light that's being emitted. Uh, Alternatively, if you do, uh, after you get to a certain time point, you move into the subradiant mode, in which case the energy becomes stored, and it's a, it's a long decay rate before that, that energy is effectively uh, emitted. So again, we, we modeled uh, uh, tryptophan networks in a, in a whole uh, uh, microtubule based on formalism used to uh, look at light harvesting complexes and photosynthesis. In this case, it was a formalism that allowed exchange of energy between uh, the, the individual dipoles of the tryptophan molecules and the, the larger energetic field or the electromagnetic field. So it could absorb the energy and then redonate it back to the, the electromagnetic field. Now what you see on the left there is a single spiral of, of a microtubule. So it's one dimer in height, and then it does 13 dimers around the, the circumference of the microtubule. And because there's that, that uh, helical structure, that left-handed helical structure of the microtubule, you see that it has that kind of offset. And so what we did was is that we would, we would evaluate, you know, what is the, the decay width? We heard, we've heard that term from, from Aristide, but we, we evaluated, you know, what is the likelihood of finding a super radiant state when the, the microtubule is only one dimer long versus two dimers long versus three? And we would increasingly uh, uh, lengthen the length of the microtubule to find out where super radiant and sub radiant states would occur. And what we found was is that when you look at one spiral up in the upper left corner there, there's a lot of, of disorder there. And the, the, the super radiant state is the one that has the, the highest uh, gamma over gamma value. That, that's the, the normalized decay width. So in the, in the one spiral, it occurred, I think, within the, uh, the first hundred. Uh, so it's maybe the, the 90th energy level within the system. Because we were looking at roughly 104 interacting dipoles uh, per spiral, you can have many, many different modes of oscillation. But as you add up numbers of, of spirals within the microtubule, that super radiant state moves down in, in energy from you know, roughly you know, the 100th the state down to in the tenth, uh, tens of spirals, it's, I think it's the third state. And when you get to 100 spirals, it is the, most, uh, the lowest energy. So what we're finding is a super radiant ground state of the system. So that means that, that when, if you have a long enough microtubule, when you irradiate it, you are going to get super radiant effects. Now, interestingly, uh, if you look at that uh, uh, graph there with the red uh, um, uh, um, trace, that's showing the order of the uh, super radiant state within, within all the states available to the system and where it occurs uh, for, that, for that most super radiant state. And what you see there is for the first uh, 12 uh, uh, spirals of the microtubule, it's, it's not the lowest energy state. But when you get to 13 spirals in length, it all of a sudden drops and you have uh, uh, one super radiant state which is in the ground state. And we're not sure why that is at this point, but it's interesting to us because you have, in this case, we have 13 protofilaments within the microtubule and you're getting that super radiant state when you have 13 spirals of the microtubule. And we're not, that may be the case. If, you, if we went to a 14 protofilament microtubule, we may find that it would be you know, up at the 14th spiral that we would get this effect. If we look at where these, these subradiant and superradiant states uh, exist and the probability of finding those states along, or how that excitation is spread across all of the, of the chromophores within a microtubule, the upper panel shows the superradiant state, and you can see that the probability, the, the, the warmer colors, is a higher probability. The probability of that, that superradiant state being found is on the outside of the microtubule. Whereas the bottom is showing the probability of finding that subradiant state, and you're finding that, that the most probable place to find that is within the inner core of the, of the microtubule. The significance of that is something we're not sure of yet, but is something we're, we're actively uh, uh, investigating. Okay, finally, I want to talk about some work that I did with uh, Robert Alfano at City College of New York and Ling Yang Shi at uh, University of California, San Diego. And this is looking at something called phano resonance. So phano resonance, uh, normally if you, if, if you excite a system um, and, and look at the emission of, from it, if you have an excitation peak, it has a nice symmetric line shape. It's, it's a, a line shape called a Gaussian, or, or more specifically, it's, it's a form called a Lorentzian. Uh, they're, they're both symmetric around the peak and they have a symmetric uh, width uh, uh, of, of half maximum. Now, in certain systems, primarily in quantum systems, if you have a discrete 
uh, um, discrete modes of the system are coupling to a background continuum, or in the case that I'm gonna be talking about, if you have discrete vibrational modes of the system, physical vibrational modes of the system, coupling to a continuous electronic background, what you can get is coupling between those, and it causes an asymmetry within that spectral line shape. And that asymmetry is referred to as a Fano line shape or a Fano resonance. And the, the degree of asymmetry you get is, uh, is ind indicative of the degree of coupling that you have. So shown there on the right in the, in the red is a Lorentzian line shape, and that Fano parameter Q uh, in the equation there, that just describes how strong the coupling is. So in the, in the high values of Q rate, you're effectively washing out the effect of the, of the discrete uh, vibrational states, and you get uh, uh, basically back the Lorentz line shape. But as you approach where you get uh, uh, an equal contribution or, or, or a, a greater contribution of the vibrational mode in conjunction with that electronic mode, you get that offset. And then when you get to a point where that, uh, the, the vibrational mode overtakes the electronic mode, you get that inverted shape there in, uh, where the final Q value is equal to zero. Now, this is interesting from an engineering standpoint because if a system uh, uh, displays this, you can begin to tune the electronic effects of the system. So you can either, you know, you could cause a, a, a compression or elongation of the system, and by changing the vibrational characteristics of the system, you can change the electronic modes of the system, or vice versa. If you can change the electronic modes, you might be able to change the vibrational characteristics. I think, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> So we, did, we used a process called uh, Raman spectroscopy, and what this does is it sends a, a laser pulse into a molecular system, and then it measures out the scattered light. So the light goes in, bounces off the system, and then we pick up what the, what the, the system is emitting. Now, in, uh, when the, the wavelength of the light is the same as the, uh, the outcoming wavelength of light is the same as the incoming wave of light, you get something called Rayleigh scattering. Uh, but if the scattering light is less, the, the wavelength is less than the incoming uh, laser light, then we, you get what's called anti-Stokes uh, scattering. And if the, if the scattering wavelength is longer than the uh, uh, incoming uh, wavelength, you get what's called Stokes scattering. Now the Stokes scattering is by, by far where you get the most signal because you're getting that longer wavelength. You, you're losing some energy into the system. And so that's, that's primar primarily what we looked at. So we looked at uh, uh, microtubules in a dry, uh, a dry state with no, no water and within an aqueous state. We sent in though, that, that probe of light and then we measured out the spectrum as it came out. Uh, on the right there, you can see both the, the powder and the uh, uh, aqueous solution form. Uh, then we, we identified the peaks using a, a uh, peak finding algorithm. And because these are well known within protein uh, uh, spectroscopy, we can label those peaks and what they belong to. So primarily they belong to the aromatic amino acids because they have, have a high degree of polarizability. Um, and, and so they interact with the light and that can inter inter interact with their uh, vibrational modes. Um, and really, we didn't really lose much of the, uh, of the detail when we, when we solvated the system. We just shifted the, the center of those peaks by a few uh, inverse centimeters. So what we decided to do was, uh, primarily what, what we'll see in the literature is they'll isolate one of those peaks and they'll remove the rest of the spectrum and then they'll fit that with a nice Lorentzian line shape. But we were trying to find these phanol resonances because you know, they have been observed in things like multi-walled carbon nanotubes. So we decided we're gonna fit every peak with a uh, uh, phano uh, line shape, and then we're gonna optimize to see how well it reproduces the experimental line shape by varying those parameters, uh, the Q parameter, the height, and the width. Uh, and we did this in an iterative fashion, so we would look at the, the, the tallest peak, fit that first, then add in the next tallest peak, and so forth until we, we fit the entire spectrum. And we would evaluate the, the uh, um, degree of, of of um, similarity between the fitted spectrum and the, the experimental spectrum, and then uh, compared each additional uh, uh, um, addition of, of a peak using the Akaiki uh, information criteria. And that tells you if you have a better model or not. So if, if that value uh, goes lower, you're getting a better model. Uh, if it goes higher, then, then it's, it's, you're getting a worse model overall. So we would keep adding peaks until we had the, the the, the best possible um, the model. And we would, we would um, try and uh, optimize those parameters by, by using a least squares 
um, uh, regression, over 40,000 iterations. And what we found was, is that out of all of those possible 24 peaks, 10 of them displayed possible phantom resonance behaviors. Uh, of those 10, primarily they were the tryptophan and the tyrosine residues that, that displayed those phantom resonance peaks. So on the right there, you can see that's the fitted spectrum over top of the experimental spectrum. And then the blow up is showing you the asymmetry in each one of those peaks. Uh, we also had one peak that was uh, uh, corresponding to a disulfide bond, an amide mode, and a, a carbon hydrogen stretch. We're not sure how that plays a role yet, but it's something that we're, we're looking into. So in conclusion, microtubules are key structures capable of modulating uh, the brain. Uh, they're, they're, they're highly organized within, within neurons. We've heard that from a rat uh, uh, previously. Um, changes to microtubule structure and stability or electrostatic effects can propagate to overall effects within the neuron. Uh, again, uh, that was something that a rat had mentioned. Uh, the aromatic amino acid network within microtubules can support several phenomena that may be leveraged for quantum photonics within this biological system. So exciton transport we've heard about, and ERAT's experiments have shown uh, agreement with, with these models. Uh, super radiance, uh, which uh, uh, Aristi didn't quite get into the, the final uh, experimental results of his delayed luminescence, but they seem to, to point towards this uh, super radiant phenomenon. And then this phanoresonant behavior, where we haven't actually come up with the, the theoretical underpinnings for it yet, but we do have the experimental results for it. So um, I didn't get to, to discuss it because of time, but uh, modeling predicts that uh, anesthetics may disrupt these processes. And we, we did hear from Arat that that, uh, that was something that he, he started to observe. Uh, however, I do want to, to stress that further modeling and experimental tests are needed uh, to come to a conclusive uh, description of these, these uh, uh, light matter interactions, especially within uh, biological systems. My references, if you would like to look these up, you can contact me later. And I'll, uh, I'll leave it for questions now for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have beautiful third-person evidence of incomplete sleep paralysis in a member of the audience here, um, pointing to a first-person state that in us would be dreaming. Maybe I can just take uh, the uh, pejorative of being um, um, a chairman and us, sort of to you and to uh, Aristide and to Arad, um, two experimental questions. Given the uh, level of light, the probable level of light uh, photon flux, it's pretty dark in the skull. Um, but given whatever levels of biophotoflux there is, uh, and given the distances that the typical axon goes anywhere between a millimeter and a meter, so it spans, you know, in the human brain, it spans easily three orders of magnitude. Sort of wh what do you expect in terms of uh, uh, ultimately information transfer? I mean, how fast and how far can it transfer? And then B, um, how do you think, you, so we know consciousness is a multicellular phenomenon, right, involving very large ensembles of neurons. So how do you get from one neuron where the, where the microtubuli end in the presynaptic junction and then you have, you know, space, you have to cause that space. To, to, typically the mechanism is diffusion, right, that would destroy all quantum information. You have to bind to the postsynaptic receptor and then do something on the other side to initiate. So those are, seem to me two unknown experimental questions and maybe each one of you can, can say, uh, sort of take your best stab at that. Over here. Maybe you can. All right, I'll, I'll take a stab. For one, we don't know. <laughs> first, first off, I mean, we have ideas. Um, in regards to the, the energy transfer, uh, you know, how far can it, can it travel? You know, a, a rat's experiment showed up to seven. Uh, some of our experiments said up to, you know, 12, uh, or at least our modeling efforts. Uh, really, we don't know, because in, in those cases, at least from my model, we were looking at a single excitation hopping, or not hopping, but, you know, resting on one, uh, one single tryptophan and then spreading across uh, the microtubule. However, when, when, when doing things like looking at the super radiant effect, we're again looking at single excitation, but now we're, we're modulating the entire length of the, of the, uh, the microtubule up to 100 uh, spirals in length. Now, the reason for that is because... But then the 100 spiral is approximately what distance? Uh, eight, 800 nanometers. 
So under a micron. Under a micron. So, you know, in, in short, if you're looking at the, the length of the photon, so we're talking about 280 nanometers. So effectively, we could get anything within a, a given sphere of 280 nanometers from the initial emission of the light. So we'd have to con consider everything within that system. That's not something we've done, but, you so know. How do you get to centimeters? I don't know. I don't know, but, but, but where I, I would consider it is, is how, you know, where that energy ends up can then influence things like motor protein transport, or it might, uh, uh, maybe it, it gets transferred to a given uh, receptor within the membrane. Okay, so, so if, if there's a GABA receptor within that membrane, maybe it's ideal that it goes to that one. And, you know, GABA receptors have been shown to be modulated by, by UV photons. So you can change the, you know, the receptor current you know, by these kind of uh, interactions. Now, again, it's, it's from our best understanding that degree of light is very, very low. Um, in regards to the, the synaptic cleft, um, I don't know. We, I, we haven't looked at that. And that is, Roger brought up a very interesting uh, uh, question a while ago. He said, why does the brain use this very, very fast, you know, electrical signal to go across an entire neuron only to have this very, very slow diffusion process at the end? And, you know, I, I don't know the reason for that either. But I'll let the other speakers chime in on that. Arat or Aristide? Yeah, I, I think the answer to the first question is that, um, and, you know, of course, as Travis said, we don't know. But I, I think the answer to the first question, you know, do, your, your question is, does UV light actually exist in the skull? And I think the answer to that is, is no, right? Uh, I don't think UV light exists in any real way in the, in the skull. The, the, the point is, can some form of energy be utilized by microtubules um, and transferred within microtubules through photonic energy? That I think our experiments have shown can happen. But 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 light does. I mean, UV light does not, I think, exist in the in the skull. Um, there is this thing called ultra weak photon emission that shows that you have very weak pulses of light that occasionally come uh, inside inside a cell, but um, that's not. I don't think that's reliable, um, right? So that's that's my answer to the first question. Aristide, do you have a comment? Yeah. So I, I uh, to to follow up on the uh, on the uh, on the speed question right so i i think that uh, if the mechanism right has anything to do with uh, a, a communication between units has anything to do with with photons then the speed is probably of no consequence so that that's sufficiently high and and what i honestly don't know is the um, what would be the time scale that is absolutely relevant for a uh, biological process to function the way it uh, it functions this is what uh, there's a huge disconnect between the time scales of uh, of these kind of processes but uh, that doesn't mean that the the, uh, the mother nature really uh, requires these uh, extremely extremely fast uh, responses if indeed there is a uh, a massive uh, delocalized response then uh, probably the uh, that that is also uh, acting in the in the time domain in other words what i'm trying to say probably is that uh, the strict description on, of, of, of time transfer and so may not be uh, absolutely critical. You, you, you gave the example of one microtubule being very long and then uh, we're talking about the transfer of something between three, four units, five units. But just imagine that this thing happens all along. There are many starting points for this information transfer along across the microtubule. So if, if these can happen in a, in a and, and, and if this process is allowed to, uh, to evolve for a sufficient long time, then it's like, like I showed you, you know, that they, this synchronization is actually gonna, gonna rule at the end. 
Okay, so, thank you. Maybe. I think this question is almost the opposite of Christoph's question, so maybe the, my assumptions are entirely wrong. But when I was imagining through the talks, when I was imagining what it would be like to be inside the cell with a, micro, a bunch of microtubules, I kept thinking, wow, what a noisy environment. I mean, if it's so responsive to electromagnetic energy, I mean, there's a lot of vibration going on um, that should be creating electromagnetic fields, um, even without any addition of any kind of tryptophan or anything. So it seems to me that a question that I have is, um, what kind of noise reduction um, uh, are there any kind of noise reduction mechanisms that can amplify, or at least reduce noise, but potentially amplify sort of real signals or induced signals rather than uh, sort of arbitrary cosmic ray type signals? Um, or are those assumptions just wrong and it's not that noisy? No, no, the, the, the actual, uh, if I may, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. So you're, you're perfectly right. The question is, is, is absolutely uh, critically important. This mechanism, if it happens, you know, it's, it's because of the uh, difference in the frequency ranges in which signals like this could uh, could actually exist and, and be transmitted or received. The coherence mechanism, there are plenty of. There's no doubt about it. So. I mean, another, another interesting point you find uh, is that microtubules have so many positively charged counter ions on their external surface that they actually lower the pH of their surroundings. Um, we just published a paper on this that, that just got published in nanoletters actually. So, so that is the extent to which they are shielded from the environment. That is the number of protons they have in their immediate uh, outer uh, surface. So, so yes, there is, there is significant shielding. Thank you very much for the informative presentations. A uh, simple two-part question. Uh, I've read that, uh, that it's possible that um, the microtubule and tubulin are piezoelectric materials. And so I'm curious about the role of crystalline structures and possibly piezoelectric crystalline structures uh, in energy transfer, synchronicity, and superradiance within the microtubules. Okay, so, so from piezoelectric, I mean, that's where if you squeeze or lengthen the, the, the structure that it generates electricity. Yeah, like yeah. flint, like flint. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, I mean, what we're looking at here is, is a photonic interaction, so it's looking at an excitation, where that's looking at a, a, an actual electron moving down or up and down the length of the, the microtubule. Um, I'm not sure how the two can couple. Um, no. I, do, do, do you have a comment, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. role they, of uh, crystalline structures in these processes. Right, right. So there is, there is a, uh, a coupling to uh, acoustic phonons that is supported by this uh, cylindrical uh, symmetry that on one of these references that I, that I, that I, that I had there is, is practically a model that describes how an excitation is coupled onto, uh, onto phonons into uh, into this uh, this structure and it's supported for actually a very long time, very, uh, very long distance in the, uh, in the structure. Right, you're perfectly right. That that is certainly uh, something that uh, is a mechanism of actually uh, uh, frequency uh, frequency change, if you want. Those uh, those uh, mechanical resonances which exist in the structure, they're real. Right. So, so I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not very informed in this area, but so I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm hearing in terms of an answer. So the crystalline structures, is it involved in the topic that we're yeah, discussing? I'll, I'll say this. So, so from, yes. from, the, from the super radiant standpoint, uh, we, we did some modeling. I didn't discuss it on the, the slide there, but if you take the, the, the same tryptophan orientation, but you take the dipole moments and randomly orient them, it's something that's not allowed biologically, but if you just scramble them, so in the same location, but they're all pointing different directions, you completely wash out any of that super radiant effect. So the fact that it's a, a, a repeating structure with a, a conserved orientation is what gives rise to that collective effect. Is that they're all working together. So if you uh, you know if you if you have a bunch of randomly oriented dipoles, it's it's not as effective at, at, at producing that effect, at least from our modeling. All right. Thank you very much.
Hey, um, really wonderful talks, very stimulating. Um, I just wanted to throw out real quick on this, this noise issue. There's some really wonderful papers by the Seth Lloyd Group at MIT and uh, Plenio and Huelga at Ulm that show actually in photosynthesis certain levels of noise can actually increase the robustness of the excitation transfer process. But my question is related to what Christoph asked about the what is the, 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 the shared oscillator mode. Um, uh, and I, I guess as an alternative to photons, uh, RSC already mentioned phonon modes that could be the shared oscillator yeah. um, in these systems. But I, I wanted to throw out whether you have considered um, also driving oscillator modes externally. Um, so you could imagine putting the samples in a solenoid and uh, uh, driving an, a magnetic field and uh, you would expect, I guess, based on the Dickey model, that uh, the transfer rate goes up with the, the field strength. And so you could see whether these transfer effects actually happen. And I guess an implication would be what, hap what does that mean macroscopically if, uh, you know, would, would that mean that certain processes would uh, differ in living, in living systems when they're placed in, in, in strong oscillating electromagnetic fields? In regards to the, um, the, the noise uh, with the Sausage group, so uh, when we had it, we, we put that energetic disorder. So we were accounting for, you know, noise in the environment. Uh, what we found was that when we didn't have that, it would only stay within those doublets of tryptophan. So you actually needed that noise to pr propagate it down the length of the, of the um, tubulin and the microtubule. So, so the noise actually assists the transfer. Now in regards to um, you know, the, the vibrational modes and phonons and whatnot, you know, that, that's uh, really what, where the photosynthetic field has gone. You know, the coupling between the electronic modes, or sorry, the, the exciton modes and the vibrational modes. And it's something I've always wanted to do, but again, you know, need funding and, and, and help. So that's something that, that, that's actively on my list. Yeah. I, I, I would like to add to this that, that, that actually what you said, that the, uh, the, the question was about the, uh, the noise helping. That's uh, actually uh, have been seen in many complex systems that this kind of a stochastic resonance manifestation is uh, is present and uh, and actually uh, leads to a massive synchronization between initially incoherent uh, incoherent oscillators you could and, and actually the the structure the regular structure helps this process makes it more more efficient actually you're you're right uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we can go ahead with the next question. Um, so I have a question. Well, actually, I actually have two questions. One of them might have already been answered um, by the other gentleman that looks like he left from the Zoom. Um, but the first one was, for some reason, I remember reading a research article regarding quantum, um, not quantum light, uh, but like light effects when the neuron gets excited the uh, potential as it travels through the axon um, releases a little bit of light and that there are certain molecules within the um, surrounding area that are able to absorb this light and somehow it's like a transfer of information that way. I want to know kind of like what your thoughts were on that. And then my main question was um, regarding the crypto, um, cryptochrome one and two and the quantum effects that have been seen, you know, with the birds, the magnetic reception, um, and I think biophotonic molecules is what someone might have referenced them as, um, and other biomolecules, if these could further regulate the quantum findings found in microtubules. So if you have, like, um, light hitting the eyes, maybe that would affect the consciousness. Okay, so, so regards to the, the um, you know, the action potential generating uh, of photons. I'm not. I'm not aware of that. Um, but you know, where where we believe that the light is coming from is from uh, the generation of reactive oxygen species. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Erat has spoken about that. So when you get these reactive oxygen uh, species, when they recombine to get rid of that that reactive effect, they can generate electronically excited molecules. And that when that relaxes, that's what lets off the photon of light. Now, the only thing I can, I can ask, I mean, w when the, an action potential is firing, is there an increase in production of ATP? Yeah, ultimately, yeah, yeah. delayed, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, if you get an increase in production of ATP, you would be getting more production of, of reactive oxygen species and then more light. So that's the only, w only mechanism I would see that, that occurring. Okay. Um, in regards to the, the cryptochrome, uh, that, that mechanism, the way that that works is that uh, it's believed that light comes into the eye, it interacts with a, a tryptophan molecule, 
and then the, the electron from that tryptophan gets shared with a flavin molecule. That sets up what's called a radical pair. Right. And if the, if the electron in that system is in a singlet state where you know, the spin, spin of one is up and the other is down, it does not respond to a magnetic field, but if it's in a triplet state where they're both pointed up, then it can respond to the magnetic field. And it's that, that response to the magnetic field which can drive differences in chemical reactivity, which is supposed to you know, result in, in changes in, in neuron firing and then the bird being able to see the, the magnetic field. Yeah, so I, that was regarding um, Christoph Simon's research. I was just wondering if you thought that that would regulate um, kind of like further consciousness once you get into the neurons, like the microtubules, whether or not they would be more or less reactive. You mean if, if uh, microtubules are responsive to the mag uh, magnetic pair, the radical pair? Um, well, so when I was reading Christoph's um, article, it said it had downstream effects affecting other, um, like estrogen and several other molecules. Oh, I'd have to, I'd have to look. Oh, okay. I've seen the paper, but I haven't, haven't gone into it in detail. I have to no worries. It. We can talk about it after. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really have to wrap up. We're already seven minutes over time. Um, um, I'm sorry the speakers, I'm sure, are willing to, ask, to answer all questions later on. We'll, we'll be around. Uh, Stuart wants to come up and close officially the, um, this wonderful conference. All right. Well, thank you, Christoph, Hartmut, Travis, Aristide, Arat, the rest of our team. Thank you for the audience hanging in there till the end of this somewhat uh, esoteric uh, uh, topic, uh, which um, and and for being here all week. It's been a great week. Thank you all, and uh, we will uh, we have concurrence and posters, and then the uh, poetry slam. Zombie Blues and Party here at about 9.30 or so when the posters wind down. And uh, we'll party until we run out of booze, probably. And uh, then after that, we'll uh, reconvene, hopefully, in uh, Sicily next, uh, I forget the dates, May, is it? In Tormino, which is a beautiful place if you haven't been there. So thank you all for being here, and uh, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs>